Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'm going to be attempting to restore the most upgradable laptop Apple has ever made, the PowerBook G3. This G3 Pismo model dates from the year 2000. Just like the logo on the lid, this laptop is a full 180 degrees from anything made today, with its wide selection of ports, express card slot on the side for adding more ports, its toolless keyboard which can be lifted out of place to reveal access to almost anything you could ever want to upgrade or repair, such as the hard drive, RAM, CPU, airport card, PRAM battery and modem. But it doesn't stop there. Apple implemented two hot swappable bays that allow you to double your runtime with two batteries or have one battery and another module, such as a DVD-ROM, floppy, zip drive or a number of other third-party made modules. This one has been neglected and was saved from a recycler by John from Roadkill Incorporated. He saves thousands of laptops from ending as e-waste. I got this one as part of a 26 kilo Mac lot I purchased from John. I'll leave his YouTube and links in the description. This PowerBook is covered in scratches and dirt. The sound doesn't work and the headphone jack looks like it's taken an impact, resulting in it becoming loose and broken. The laptop is also missing a key and the DVD drive cover. I haven't touched this laptop since unboxing it from the 26 kilo Maclot video. Trying to turn it on, I found that nothing happened and the laptop was dead. At first I thought it must have been my charger, however thanks to a video from a mate Nathan, better known as P. Sivright, I learned that it might be the PRAM battery causing the issues. So I opened up the keyboard and disconnected the wire going to the PRAM battery. Trying again, this time around the laptop booted right up with its beautiful red display. The redness in the display goes away after about 30 seconds to a minute and the screen looks perfectly normal. Now we'll get a network time error here, this is because we've disconnected the PRAM battery which was dead in the first place anyway. After taking out the DVD drive and lifting up the keyboard again, we can actually fully remove this battery. Looking at it closely, it appears to be made up of a few button cell batteries. As working replacements are very hard to find, I'm going to try and dissect the battery to see whether I can install new battery cells. Building a replacement one of these should be possible. You can see each of the four cells have been spot welded together. These batteries are 2330 cells. Not only could I not find these on store shelves, but the main issue would be linking the new batteries, as I don't have a spot welder. I did try soldering on one of the batteries to test that method, but it didn't work as the solder breaks loose too easily. So I'll just leave the PRAM battery out, as the computer works perfectly fine without it. Removing the keyboard, I'm going to disassemble this laptop entirely so we can take a look at the headphone jack and hopefully repairing that jack will allow the sound to come back as I believe it is stuck in the line out mode. In doing this, I'm also going to be able to demonstrate how easy this computer is to work on. Right away, I'm able to access one of the RAM modules and the CPU cooler. Removing it, I can simply pull up and unlatch the CPU board. On the first side, you'll see the CPU and one RAM module and on the other side you'll find that other RAM module and what I believe is the graphics chip. This makes upgrading the processor super easy and third parties even made G4s work in these older G3 machines. Unplugging and removing our 6 gig hard drive, I can take out the modem before we move up to the top portion of this laptop. Removing the cover over the hinge, I can disconnect the LCD cable and start removing the backlight controller. It is plugged in with two cables, so after removing that, it is free to come out. Around back, I can remove four torque screws. These are the screws holding in place the display assembly, so if you've ever got a loose hinge, it's pretty easy to tighten. With the display removed, we still need to dig a little bit deeper so we can get access to our DC inboard, which houses the headphone jack. I'll need to disconnect the trackpad cable and several screws holding in place the top casing. One of the pegs holding in place the top case was already snapped off, likely from years of use. After unfastening all the screws on the bottom of the laptop, there's a few more inside I'll remove before separating the two halves. It is clipped in at the top, so I'll need to carefully maneuver it out of place, being sure to disconnect the power button and speaker cables. With the top casing removed, I'm going to disconnect this interconnect board for the batteries, remove this one piece of shielding up top, and finally, we can get access to our DC in and headphone jack. I'll carefully lift up, disconnecting it from the main logic board. And now you can see the issue. It's completely broken away from its solder joints. Unfortunately though, there's a giant piece of metal shielding that goes over these two connectors. So if I want to reflow the solder, I'll need to remove the shielding first. 
This proved challenging, as while heating up the solder joints, you are also heating up the shield on the other side, as it's acting as a heatsink. So I needed a very hot soldering iron to accomplish this. With the shielding finally removed, I can apply some fresh solder onto our headphone jack. It appears as though it didn't really have a whole lot of solder on it from the factory anyway. And our end result looks pretty good, so hopefully this will restore sound for our power book. I'll reinstall the shielding on top, but before we get that installed, I'm going to brush out the inside of this laptop as it's got a bit of dust in the fan and a few dead bugs. I can reconnect our repaired DC inboard before reinstalling the frame and battery control board. With the laptop open, this is a great time to check out how the hot swappable drive bays work. You can see on the right side a battery and data connector to allow a module or battery to be connected. On the other side, you'll only find a battery connector, so unfortunately you can't run two modules at a time. After looking at that marvel of engineering, it's time to start reassembling the rest of the laptop. I'll reinstall the shielding and give the internals a bit more of a clean before I attach the top casing. I'll reconnect the power and speaker cables before reconnecting a few more ribbon cables and installing a few more screws. Flipping the laptop over, I'll reinstall the seven screws that help hold on the top casing. With that out of the way, it is time to reinstall our LCD panel. Simply sliding it into place, I can reinstall the four torque screws behind the port door on the back of the laptop. There's a couple more screws inside the laptop I'll need to fasten before we get working on getting our display reattached. I'll reconnect the backlight controller reconnect the LCD cable and its fastening screw before I route the airport antenna cable. Reinstalling the clutch cover, our laptop is starting to take shape. All I need to reinstall is the modem, the six gigabyte hard drive, and the airport card. Proceeding, we'll need to install our CPU module. This houses 128 megabytes of RAM. I don't currently have any higher capacity memory modules, so 128 megabytes will have to do. With that being said though, this machine can support up to a whopping one gig of RAM. I'll need to clean off our CPU and heatsink prior to reinstalling some new thermal paste. Applying a generous portion to the CPU die, I can reinstall the three screws holding in place the heatsink. With that, all that remains is to install this metal shielding and the keyboard which simply plugs into place. With that, I can fold it over and test out the laptop. Pressing the power button, this happened. We did it. It now has working functional sound. We still of course have our bright red screen on boot which slowly fades to the correct colour. This is likely due to the age of the backlight in this display panel. With our laptop functioning, it's time to fix a few of the cosmetic flaws this laptop has, starting off with a replacement up arrow key. I managed to find one of these online, and it's fair to say parts for these laptops are getting harder and harder to find. So whilst installing it, I was very nervous about breaking this plastic clip, which proved quite challenging to connect into place. I ended up using a pair of tweezers which helped me squeeze it in a little bit so I could get the plastic pegs installed into their metal brackets. However, after that was done, I could simply push the keycap into position. Good as new. The last thing I'll need to do is give this laptop a good clean. It's come from a recycling facility and it's been used pretty heavily over the years, so it's grimy and pretty disgusting. I'll use some alcohol to try and clean this up as best I can. This laptop is going to be far from perfect in cosmetic condition because of just how scratched and beaten up it is. There are many cracks in the plastic which of course I can't remove, but I'll do my best to make this laptop look as good as it can. I even tried using some 2000 grit wet sandpaper to try and buff out some of the scratches. However, this actually made it slightly worse, so definitely don't try that. With no obvious way of removing the scratches in the plastic, I'll move on to installing some new feet on the base. With the outside portion of the laptop nice and clean, it's time to get the palm rest and display looking just as nice. 
So I'll use the same methods with alcohol and a microfiber cloth to do the best in removing all of the grime on this laptop. For harder to reach areas, I used an old toothbrush to be able to scrub into the grooves and speaker grills of the laptop. Finally, I'll wipe down the keyboard and palm rest as well as our display and we're done. So this is it, a 2000 PowerBook G3 Pismo. While it's not in the greatest cosmetic condition, it definitely cleaned up nicely and looks better than it did before. I wasn't able to find a replacement DVD drive or faceplate, however, given how easy it is to replace, if I come across one, it's a 5 second install. While the battery also doesn't hold a charge anymore, I may resell the battery at a later date if I get the correct equipment to do it safely. This laptop works fine, including both internal and external audio through the headphone jack we repaired. This laptop is running macOS 9.2, which is full of beautiful sound effects. Take a listen. For those wondering for what the specs of this machine are, it's got a 400MHz G3 processor, 128 megs of RAM, and a 6GB internal hard drive. With all that being said, I truly wish laptops were still built just as well as this very machine here. It is so upgradable and so repairable, if Apple made one of these machines today, I would definitely rush out and go and buy one. However, in 2020, we see most of what is soldered on components and anti-repair mechanisms to stop anyone from fixing or upgrading their own device. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the Vintage Computer Playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any tips or what tools I use to repair devices, be sure to check out my website, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video and I'll catch you guys next time.